Let's begin. Initiation hermetics. Now, when you get into the initiation process, the fabric of initiation is separating consciousness, your mental body, from your astral body, from your physical body, and then generating a type of realignment, uh, reconnecting everything. The, the center of gravity of consciousness is attachment-based, so it's craving-based. You want this, you want that. With academics, it'll be inside the academic mind, the root of their consciousness, that they have to go through this framework of, of thinking, uh, is this the most intelligent thing to do when they do something? So we have these different roots of consciousness. Uh, the start of initiation is to separate all those layers of um, fabrication of the way our mind thinks, the way I'm, our the way we feel and the way our body acts, and then resetting it. So this process starts with the first exercise, observing the rising four way of thought. Now this is equivalent to what they call mindfulness in Buddhism. The four foundations of mindfulness, mindfulness in the body, mindfulness of feeling, mindfulness of the mind, and mindfulness of phenomena. The physical body, the astral body, the mental body. And to be mindful of phenomena, you have to be outside of it, which is Akasha. So it's the same fundamental vibrational scale layout as seen in Buddhism. This awareness needs to separate itself from the observed. So when you're observing an object, you and the object need to have a, a very clear distinction of, of, of disconnection while penetrating and connecting. So it's a bit of a oxymoron there because you're doing two opposing things at the same time. Now, by observing your thoughts arise and fall away, the fabric of consciousness learns not to touch thought. So we get this separation taking place. People who are highly intuitive uh, have this separation already there. People who are damaged from drugs and a bit spaced out, their mental body separated. Now, if they're able to connect to intuition or not, it's a different thing, but the mental matrix is thinned out. And uh, the downside of taking that type of path is if you don't have any willpower. Your willpower is uh, taken away because it's outside of the mind's ability to concentrate control itself while in that state. When you do it through observing the rising four way and continuous releasing and dissolving of the tension and the stress between the mind and object, which is the astral emotional arising, you get the, the layers pull apart and you get a very, very clear, distinct sense of what you're paying attention to. So what you look at just gets clearer and clearer and clearer because you're not emotionally referencing. So it's a clarity of mind and that clarity of mind is known as mindfulness in Buddhism. Throughout this course of initiation, um, I'll be referencing into the Buddhistic type of work because I have an interest in it. And um, a lot of hermeticists that I've met uh, also practice heavily in Buddhism. So it's nice to, to see a comparative analysis between the different types of psychology and the different approaches to development. All right. So observing your thoughts rise and fall away, it generates a very, very clear, concise separation between the observer and the observed. Now, what this does is allows the mind to generate equanimity. What stops equanimity are the attachments, the fabrications, the referencing, the intellect, the way we think, feel, and act. As soon as we separate the feeling and the action and the, the mind and the feeling, uh, there's stillness, the static drops away. So as you observe the rising form way of thoughts and step one mental training, there's an accumulation of stillness almost as if the thoughts have to travel from further away to reach your mind. So this accumulation of stillness from observing, is, is, it's, that's the gem. That's what defabricates the mental astral matrix and allows the spirit and the mind to be free. You want to monitor, monitor that because that is what the exercise is for. So as you're observing your, your thoughts come and go, and you notice that everything is becoming stiller, the thoughts are, are coming from afar, uh, mentally note that quality and anchor it in. Invite it in as a permanent part of your meditative practice. 
that whenever you want to go into equanimity, it's very, very easy just to go back to that place and uh, hit your ritual and then go into that stillness, into that equanimity. Now, we have a whole range of different types of equanimity. We have equanimity in the mental body in relation to the mind itself. We have equanimity in the mental body in relation to the mind through the, the uh, visual gate, through the sound gate, through the sense, through the taste, through the feeling, and so forth. We have all these different gates through which information flows. And the five senses and the mind itself are the main ones we look at. But there are other gates in, in, in the consciousness as well, which we'll cover at a later time, which we need also to bring into equanimity. Okay, so, so this process of observing the rising, falling away, and generating separation, and monitoring in your journal how still and how separated your mind is from the, from the mental thought forms, from the emotions, from the body, in order to do this well, you need to log in all these different feeling qualities, which are um, or sensory qualities of mental space. So what is the temperature of the mental space? Uh, do a two-minute round observing temperature. What is the texture? Of the, the, is it rough? Is it smooth? Is it silky? Um, get the texture, the, the, the fundamental feeling of that mental space. Is there any edges to that mental space? Uh, is it um, uh, spaceless, that there's no edge? Is it infinite? Or is that mental space that you're observing a uh, cocoon around you? Uh, note all these conditions here that in which your mind is in. Uh, and there are dozens and dozens of them which you, you'll, you'll come, that'll come up and you'll just note them. And the reason why you want to do this is that when you become aware of something, you can put it, your relationship to it into equanimity. You have greater and deeper stillness. Let's say um, you go into the mental space and you go, oh, wow, it's a bit cold in here. You know, it's my, my mind is cold. Um, and that coldness creates a stagnation in, in, in your awareness and the speed of your thinking it might be an excess of type of water element. Then you can... Uh, move that frequency up to a faster movement and your intellect will switch on and your spirit and your intellect will be more synchronized and you'll be able to connect to genius ideas more easily. So there'll be all these side effects from doing this exercise and simply making observations about things, your mind's relationship to those qualities and bringing it into equanimity. And uh, that allows the spirit to express itself through the mental astral physical more efficiently by reorganizing the spirit's relationship. Now, the spirit has all these different resistors between its pure essence, between its pure spirit or pure consciousness, and your astral physical body. It seeks to express itself spiritually all the time, but simply unable to. So this first exercise, even so Baden says do it for two weeks, I've been practicing it for well over 30 years, and I still practice it all the time. Uh, but I use a lot of different tools like Akasha, light, non-dual light, layers, daily yoga, to defabricate. Because this first exercise takes you all the way to Nibbana, takes you to the end. So it's not a two-week exercise. It's a lifetime progression, but you're continually refabricating, reframing how you practice. You're, you're, you're going deeper and looking at it from a more universal view, how you do this particular exercise. So the first exercise is your last exercise. Now, when, when you do the initiation process, there's a, there's a perception of step one to step ten. And uh, inside of the astral plane, it's released of time. Uh, inside the mental plane, it's released of space. Inside the akasha, it's timeless and spaceless. And uh, non-dual light, it's, it's something that... Um, it, it can't be verbalized. So how can the initiation process possibly be linear? That doesn't make any sense from a metaphysical view. So you look at the step one exercises to the step 10 exercises more of a holographic, but then one part is all parts, because your first exercise takes you all the way to the end. So you, you need to not stop at any particular exercise that you're working on and go, no, I'm just going to stream through these exercises and flow with them, have fun, 
Because if I concentrate on that coffee cup over there and my concentration gets stronger, my mindfulness is going to get stronger. My ability to work with the elements is going to be stronger. My vital breathing will be stronger. My ability to connect to light will be stronger. Everything gets better from every exercise. So to, to work with exercises with which you have fun and you have an enjoyment and you have a spiritual high, like doing the air element standing on the top of a mountain, those types of, um, and doing air elements of walking up the mountain, those types of exercises give you very, very rapid growth because one part is connected to all parts. There's no separation in, in, in this. Everything is connected. So we need to change the psychology. Franz Baden says, don't move on to the next exercise until you completed this one. That means that if it's a difficult exercise, you're, going to, you're failing and you're going to compound failure, your self-image is going to fail and then you're not going to continue on the journey. That's not how initiation works. He must probably put this in to protect it from immature people from misusing the information. Because an intuitive person is going to go, of course, it's outside time and space. The spirit is in this time, in this space right now, uh, and I'm growing, but that's not his true spiritual nature. It just gives us choices so that we can evolve and work towards Nibbana. Okay, so... Uh, this first exercise, the, the key points are look at all the qualities of the mental space, of the thought forms. How magnetizes a thought form that breaks your concentration? So you're watching a thought arise and fall away and all of a sudden you get caught in a thought. Your mind's making a story and you're having an emotion in relation to that story and your, your, your body's reacting and planning to do something and all of a sudden, ah, I'm not meant to touch my thoughts. <clears throat> so you just learn the creation cycle and then you step back and release and go back to observing you just learn the destruction cycle or the release cycle so this is how thought feeling actions are generated and if that action was repeated over and over i would have a habit if it was repeated to the point of, of me not having to think about out of a very deep subconscious habit and uh the reverse is also true in your release process. If you're mindful of these habits, and as soon as they arise, you pull the root out, you step back, defabricate, the habit dissolves and disappears. So the same way you create habits, you reverse engineer and you release habits. So you learn all these things by, by doing high-quality journaling. Very difficult to have success in this path without journaling. Now, in Buddhism, they don't do journaling. They, 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 the Buddha didn't teach people to, to, to fill out a journal. Uh, and the reason for this is their, their only objective is to attain Nibbana. So they take refuge in the Buddha mind, they take refuge in the Dharma path, they take refuge in the, in the enlightened beings, and uh, they go, this is where I'm going. They have their eye on the, on the goal all the time. In Hermetics, we're learning. We're learning about the nature of creation. We're learning about the, the whole creative process. And we're in a path of service until that time that we decided it's time to work on purely attaining Nibbana. So that path of service, you may be working as a healer and you have to understand the metaphysical nature of healing. You can only really do that by looking at the relationship between the mind, the astral ego and the body through mindfulness. If you want to be a master of any skill, of any anything, this knowledge, it gives you the key, the highest keys to mastery of that skill. So it's very different to Buddhism. We're learning about the universe, learning about how things are constructed. Totally different to, I just want to work on the last door to attain Nibbana. And Buddhism really is a science based on releasing the self to attain Nibbana. It's that last door. It's pretty much useless for people who are not highly psychically tuned in. It's, it creates a very high degree of delusion for someone who's not intuitive to read a book on Buddhism and think they understand it and really jump into it. It's it just not going to work for them. So it uh, every Dharma Every universal law that the Buddha presented is a tuning fork. 
the mind has to transfer onto that tuning fork, come into resonance with it, the spirit absorbs and understands, and then it may or may not metabolize down through the astral physical body. Spiritual knowledge is a product of the spirit. Spiritual knowledge is not an intellectual property. It can't be intellectualized correctly, because the moment the intellect grabs it, it's already destroyed the tuning fork. It's not in resonance with the pure frequency of what that knowledge is in a universal vibrational state. So the intellect can never do any justice for spiritual knowledge. So reading about Buddhism is a contradiction in itself. So what we want to do is look at well, what is the process to developing the spirit senses? What is the process to awakening intuition? What is the process for getting the, the physiological instincts to become fine-tuned so that you can walk in resonance with universal laws on the dharmic path to attain nibbana, come in resonance with divinity, depending on which uh, words you're using. So it's quite important from a very early stage of, uh, of training to get this idea that um, uh, you, you want to be looking at, am I looking to attain nibbana? And that's my goal, or am I in a path of service, or am I working these two things and balancing them together? Because the way you practice will change. If you're working towards nibbana, every exercise has a type of equanimity, a type of stillness which accompanies the exercise. You harvest the equanimity. You anchor it into every facet of consciousness so that everything becomes stiller, quieter, and deeper. <clears throat> if you're not uh, if you're not doing that, you're not going to come uh, into that ascension gateway to raise up uh, towards nibbana. Uh, if you're in uh, a um, service path, you're bringing things into form, so you're balancing uh, qigong and drawing vital energy and teaching metaphysical skills and and uh, channeling universal knowledge and bringing different sciences into form uh, and taking care of people on all these different levels through all these different paths. So the, the method you choose to be in, in service will re usually require you to bring things into form rather than defabricate and taking things out of form. So you will end up with this, your personal path of, okay, I'm, I'm uh, in a process of learning, and ascension, and then my service path, I'm bringing energy into form to be in a in a in a place of service. So this is uh, very important to um, to understand that when you're training, you have your self fulfilling prophecy of where you're going, and that's where your destination. That's where you're going to go. That's what initiation is going to do for you. And um, it's important to know that to to be in a path of service, you have to work on yourself first before you can help someone else. Now, let's say you're a nurse, you have to develop a degree of compassion to be compassionate to the people you're caring for. So just from a basic psychological view, you have to take care of you to take care of others to a degree, to give good quality care. You have to have a good quality sense of self-love. This will go right across the vibrational scale and the whole spectrum of paths of service. Work on yourself first to put yourself in a state of capacity to help others. Okay, back to the, the step one mental training. Now, as we register all these different qualities of the experience in our journal, by writing them in our journal, we're attaching a sense of understanding which brings our relationship to that piece of data into equanimity, which stills the mind further and allows you to develop more skill. So how you psychologically frame this in your journal so that each time you write down a feeling quality, that knowledge is power to generate more equanimity to be better at the exercise. It's important to, to recognize this, understand it, and start developing are developing this. If you don't um, have this in place, then there's going to be wasted time. And <clears throat> believe me, there's much more interesting things to do uh, in in the in the initiation process than uh, re repeat beginners' exercises, not getting results. 
even though the, the beginner's exercise is a fabric for the whole book, it allows you to have really spiritually blissful and rapture type experiences through the other exercises and you want to get there as quickly as possible. You want to maintain high degree of fun. Now this word fun is that you wake up in the morning and you want to practice. You think, oh, I'm going to do a sit, it's awesome, and you go and practice it. It's like a kid running to the video game. You, you have to generate a type of excitement in your spirit to, to enjoy the, the journey, to enjoy the path. This is not work. People who work either fail or take a very long time to get there. They block themselves through the nature of the effort they're putting in. People who are having fun, they're opening the mental space, they're excited like little children practicing, and they're going, wow, I just love this stuff, this is great. They're the people who succeed. So you need to frame the psychology of how you approach practice and get it tuned in, get it tuned in to work for you. <coughs> now, there are some people who need a very military approach. And in the beginning, that's really helpful. <coughs> but over the, over the years, you're going to find that uh, the more you, you uh, get your psychology right, the faster the results come. So the way you engage your spirit into a type of blissful enjoyment of the experience, you're going to get a much faster result, a better result in each exercise. Ultimately, we're training the spirit. We're training the spirit to regulate the astral body, regulate the physical body, and take the spirit, move it into Akashic states, and then tune into the non-dual aspect of the spirit in the non-dual light states. And then all the way up to Nibbana, it's the, it's the highest layer of the spirit. So that's really what we're training. And what happens when your physical body dies? Your mental astral matrix dissolves. Your astral body is just an emotional bag of energy which falls away and your spirit rises, the center of gravity of spirit dictates a like equal force. If you've been practicing non-dual light, the spirit will go into non-dual light. If you're practicing uh, uh, lower shamanic, low frequency, physical, magical type of energy, well, that's where your spirit's been paying attention to. So whatever you pay attention to is where you're going to go. And this equates to all religion. If you're uh, fearing God and 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 uh, taking a, uh, a highly Christian view of your spiritual practice, and you're paying attention to that all the time, your spirit is going to, to go into a state of an equal frequency and, and hierarchical structure to what you pay attention to. So it's very, very important to remember that um, you, you are vibrational match to God pay attention to that vibrational match to God's free equanimity, and you'll go to a very, very high frequency space because that's what you pay attention to. Okay. We'll leave it there. Thank you for your time, and uh, see you on the next video.